So let's uh, get started. Welcome to CS372. Uh, like I mentioned last time, we're going to the final uh, lecture series on consciousness and mind. And the first lecture was given by Dr. Duvari because we really want the psychiatrist to come in to tell us the real, real world situations. Something is normal and something mentally is disorder or abnormal. So, you know, psychiatrists, when they try to diagnose whether someone has uh, mental disorders, they definitely comparing uh, normal behaviors with abnormal beha behaviors. So let me project the slide first. Okay. So today's lecture, we will be focusing on consciousness, how to model consciousness. But as I mentioned last time, there are several topics we need to cover and started with a, a comparison between normal and abnormal behaviors. And then today we focus on consciousness and next time will be where is consciousness and then how it works. And finally, we will address uh, mind and ethics. And which at this point, you may consider to be a little bit abstract. But once we lay out the foundation of what is consciousness and where it is, and maybe mind and ethics can be uh, more evident, and even we, we, we attempt to quantify them. So let's look at uh, why we want to study the topic. And it all started about two and a half years ago when Yoshio Banjo at the New York IPS conference, he gave a keynote on the limitations of the current AI. And uh, in a talk, uh, basically we all understand the limitation today. Uh, our AI today requires large volume of training data and lacking robustness. And if you're just changing a few pixels, classification uh, could be erroneous. And uh, we have problem with explainability, reasoning, and causal analysis. And we all understand we have generalization uh, problems. And uh, so Benjo mentioned there are two avenues to address the issue. One is we develop some band-aids to try to patch so-called the system one today. And then the second approach is let's start from afresh, start from scratch, start from high level cognition. So here there are two philosophical thinking. One is, is consciousness, or they call system two, is consciousness purely computational, just like system one. So I will get into slightly details about why we think unconsciousness, the processing is only computation, and the consciousness may be computation only, or maybe beyond computation. So Benjo's idea was computation all the way. But if you talk to other scholars, uh, their thoughts like uh, uh, Roger Penrose, and he would say no, because uh, consciousness and unconsciousness mechanisms are different. So some matters may not be uh, purely computational. And it's interesting when I came across the book published by uh, Erwin Schrodinger in 1944. This is a very, very long time ago. And Erwin is the, the grandfather or the father of quantum mechanics. So in his book, even almost 80 years ago, uh, he actually depicted the idea of consciousness. And I think his book is interesting because he doesn't talk about philosophy or theology, but he really focuses on physics, using physics to explain uh, consciousness. So you, you see some science there rather than just abstract thinking and the debating. In Benjo's talk, he mentions a book published by Daniel. The title of the book is Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. And System 1 at the bottom is the current AI. And uh, Daniel characterizes uh, the current AI to be thinking fast. Thinking habitually, intuitively, unconsciously and uh, we cannot explain the mechanism or causality. And system two, on the other hand, 
is uh, thinking slow. We think logically, sequentially, we plan and uh, we conduct reasoning. Mapping thinking fast and thinking slow or system one, system two to psychological study. And uh, you look at uh, the father of psychiatry, Freud, his view of human mind has two parts. At the bottom, uh, we consider to be unconsciousness. And let's, let's uh, go up the, the figure on the right hand side. And unconsciousness, according to Freud, there are fears, uh, violent motives, unacceptable sexual desires, irrational wishes, and so on and so forth. And the consciousness, including thoughts and perceptions. So this is really in the early days. And Freud came up with this kind of classification. But it's interesting to me, on conscious level, and Freud put down a few very uh, negative ad adjectives. For instance, be before wish, and Freud put irrational, and uh, urges immoral, right, or needs, and you put selfish in front of it. But our needs, right, we have urge to perhaps we are really hungry, or we get some external stimuli, and we, we feel hurt. And you couldn't actually put a moral value in front of those needs, right? So moral judgment should be probably in the consciousness, consciousness level. So let's don't judge morality at this point until the last lecture. But basically, a lot of functions of human being was in unconscious state. And one evident example is our breathing. And we don't have to pay attention to our breathing. And that we don't have to be conscious about our heartbeat. Everything is done uh, virtually automatically. So let's define what is consciousness. And this is a very challenging topic. And uh, you get perspectives from different disciplines, including physicists, biologists, neuroscientists, theologians, philosophers, computer scientists, and so on and so forth. And uh, there have been over 20,000 papers published so far, uh, but producing little result. But let's come back to consciousness. And let's look at some uh, uh, prominent definition. The first definition was given by uh, Miko Kaku, and he is a very famous physicist. And uh, he said, well, consciousness can be defined in relation to the space, right, to us. If we want to be conscious about our presence, yes, we have the, the sense of space, and we also have the sense of sense of time. And uh, the time is critical because uh, we, if we want to uh, derive some thoughts, we need to probably look into the into the past. So we have to tap into the memory, and uh, we want to do planning. We want to be able to project into the future. So space and time, we typically, typically we accept those are critical uh, foundations of uh, consciousness and also in relationship to others and uh, let's uh, give some examples and those are these are the examples given by uh, kaku so it's debatable whether plants have consciousness or not but but kaku basically saying if you look at uh, consciousness which can be quantified by number of feedback loops so any mechanisms which have feedback loops and can enhancing their livings you can probably just consider that's consciousness for plants okay plants can sense temperature and can sense where the water is so the roots of the plant would go toward or grow toward the direction of water and uh, the so many flowers would be uh, grow toward the, the, the sun or to, toward the, the high temperature direction. And if you look at our pets, these are mammals typically, and uh, they will react to threats and they have interactions to human and other animals. And for human beings, we have a lot of uh, sensors or feedback loops. And we do learning and like, for example, learning, I think teacher will provide feedback and uh, we have emotion, emotion react to other people and other people would also provide our, their feedbacks. We have been constantly being evaluated in this society. So consciousness versus attention. 
uh, these are two different terms. Attention already been studied and thoroughly by psychiatrists, but also in computer science, you know, our attention model using, using the term attention. And, but strictly speaking, these are two different ideas and two different terms. So it's possible, or it's actually kind of consciousness and attention, they are entangled with each other, but they are distinct in the brain functionality. And uh, we generally, we can treat consciousness as synthesizer or a summer, summarizer. Uh, the, the consciousness will kind of summarize in the entire environment using different sensors. For instance, sitting in the classroom, we use our visual ears, we use our uh, different organs to try to sense the entire environment. And but analyzer is, is done by attention module. And attention module, for example, I look at the entire classroom, then I want to talk to Bill, I pay my attention to one individual, and this is because I already know the entire contextual information. And when I want to zoom into a specific uh, individual, I'm doing attention more focused. So you could say consciousness may operate in a long, in a longer time scale, uh, including information summary, planning, decision making. And attention is to select uh, the information to meet the current behavior objective. So one is longer term, one is shorter term. Okay, let's look at one example used by uh, psychiatrists. If we look at the screen right now, we see uh, some symbols here, right? So for the bottom up uh, consciousness, basically we are sensing the pixels, our eyes, retinas, sensing these pixels, and there's an image perception in our brain. And uh, consciously, we try to detect or try to recognize this symbol. So how many people consider this is a, a digit, two digits, or an alphabet, right? Uh, you can B, yeah, 13 and B is ambiguous, right? Uh, but let's say if you have these three characters in a row, so this is called top-down attention. You have you are you are conscious aware of several characters here. Then when you zoom in to pay attention to the middle character, you tend to say this is a, a B. But if you have another uh, sequence of numbers, and here you would probably likely to say thirteen. So top down attention works differently from bottom up attention. In the end of this lecture, I would uh, go back to talk about the current machine learning model the attention model. Attention model, the current implementation is pretty much bottom up, uh, not top down. But do we need to have top down attention being to machine learning? I think my answer is absolutely yes. So this is a really interesting opportunity. And when we talk about system one, system two integration, this is opportunity to enhancing system two. So we can model subjectivity into AI. Uh, right, subjectivity, let's uh, do a very just simple discussion. Uh, two different people look at the same instance of object and they have, may have different feelings. But when you say objectively, no, a machine, when a machine perceives an object, the machine can only come up with one classification. Otherwise it's a bug. Otherwise we say it's an error, right? So subjectivity has to be top down. And where is this top? And uh, if you say objectivity, the bottom up will be sufficient. Okay. So with discussion one, uh, is it possible that consciousness is absent of attention? So we are in a consciousness state, but there's no attention whatsoever. Pretty much I already give the answer, but it's still debatable. I mean, if you look at uh, articles in psychiatry, what's the difference between conscious and, and attention? They have done lots of experiments and looking at uh, the brain activities uh, under different situations, uh, they're still not, not, not very conclusive. But, but in principle, people agree the top-down attention mechanism, we need to be in, in, in consciousness state. 
right? But the bottom up is debatable because if you talk to psychiatrists, they have different ideas. But if I read into Schrodinger's model, and which I will show in the next slide, the question is, when do we transition from unconscious state to conscious state? When you ride your bike today or take Margarita to the campus today, are you consciously, are you always in conscious mode when you ride your bike? You say, I'm balancing on the bike. And when we learn how to, how to bike, how to, you see kids learn how to walk, they are constantly in, in a consciousness state. If they want to balance themselves, they don't want to fall. But I don't think most of us walking on the campus today, we, we are very conscious about balancing our body, right? So we are walking in pretty much unconscious state or in the biking situation, I, I saw my neighbors uh, because I live in front of uh, Palo Alto High School and quite a lot of uh, students biking at the same time watching on their phones, right? So definitely they are not pay, paying any attention, not probably not even in their conscious state when they are on biking. The, the notion of biking uh, is already kind of in unconscious state because it's already habitual. So let's look at how they transition to each other so we may be able to understand some insights. And according to Schrodinger, uh, we, if we are in the unconsciousness state, to gain to consciousness state, there must be a quantum jump, quantum jump, a quantum mechanism uh, phenomenon. So quantum jump means you have two different states of an atom. And uh, you want to transition from one state to the second one, there must be the energy surge. And once you have energy surge to a certain level, then there's the probability and quantum jump or state transition will happen. And likewise here, and Chodinger is saying, if a person is in unconsciousness state, let's say we continue sensing the environment, our body sensing the temperature, but in the beginning, we don't feel anything different, right? But accumulatively, and we start to feel very warm and getting hotter and hotter. And then suddenly there's a quantum jump and we start to feel if there's, a, there's some kind of heat or cold. And now the feeling of heat or feeling of cold really get into consciousness state. So, but there's another situation which we would look at some scenarios in the next slide. So you look at the left hand side, sensitization typically is classified to act in unconscious state. So like uh, acrophobia, I don't know, I, I do have a fear of heights. And when I walk on uh, like Chicago, this, this, uh, this tall building, there's a observatory, right? You walk out there, there's a piece of glass under your feet. And I just couldn't stand up. And you ask me whether I'm consciously fear about height or unconsciously fear about height, I have to say, I cannot control myself, right? So that's considered to be phobia, considered to be uh, in unconscious state. And a lot of people have phobia about noise, about something uh, they don't like, like my one of my daughter has phobia with uh, spiders. So another second one is uh, happy, happy situation. Uh, something just going on for, for a long, long time and uh, something re repetitive going on. And uh, one example is sensing and sensing if there's no sufficient energy to uh, incur a state transition, it's just continue to, to be done in an unconscious, unconscious state. Like right now I'm watching this uh, entire classroom and if I don't pay attention to anything, do you think I can sense the water fountain outside the outside the windows actually i could right so water fountains out there unless i pay attention to matters outside the window is in my sensing in the domain of my sensing but it's in unconsciousness uh, state and so our organ operations breathing heartbeat and there's no way we can control them and they just function so-called normally. 
and we pay attention to them only when our breathing gets into trouble or our heartbeats get into trouble. Metabolism, right? You don't care. You don't. You don't actually pay attention to how you digest the food and how the nutrition get distributed into the blood vessels. Uh, this uh, figure here shows there are two dimensions. One in the S axis is a computational complexity. On the left hand side, computational complexity is very low. On the right hand side, computation requirement is very high. And in the vertical axis, we show on the top is consciousness, and at the bottom is unconsciousness. So the first question here is one plus seven. Right? We, we probably consider this to be computation non intensive. And uh, pi square, right? It's, it's more complex. And to us, right? One plus seven, we can do it in seconds. But pi square requires us to work on this arith arithmetic for really some time. Actually, pi square, this could, could, probably could don't, don't have an answer. Right? This is a pi, it's a huge number. Uh, so we do arithmetic in unconsciousness state or consciousness state. Even computationally can be very simple, right? One plus seven is very simple. We have to do it in conscious consciousness state, and that's this is probably an easy example. Do you have a disagreement? Let's now look at the more challenging situation. I'm going to show a different applications, and let's try to put them in the right place. The first is uh, let's play Go. Not, not playing with computers, just people playing Go. Where should we place uh, this kind of chess playing or Go game? Should it be computationally intensive or it's trivial or it's in conscious state or we can play a game in unconscious state? Computationally high, okay. Conscious, right? We we cannot just uh, sleep and play chess. So the second question is vision. Our vision is it conscious day or unconscious? Visible. Both. 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 Yes. Yes. Yes, good point. So sensing, right? Sensing can be in unconscious state. But when we have feeling, when we try to pay attention to certain things, then we, we gain to a conscious state. That's good. And the alpha go, what do you think? Alpha go is for sure computationally intensive, right? When the training has been it's been, been performed. But if alpha go has already recorded all the possible moves. Uh, during playing with uh, with an individual, that individual is really in a hustling state, right? consciousness and the computation complex, thinking very very uh, slow and try to project all the possible moves in the future. But how about AlphaGo in the in the playing mode, not in the training mode? Do you think the computation complexity is extremely high? And uh, do you think it's it's really in the consciousness state to play with the human? Because we know machine may not have consciousness, right? So Alpha Go in the playing mode, it's in unconsciousness state. And what it's doing is doing search, seeing the current layout of the board. And uh, because you already trained itself to see all possible moves. So you say, oh, this is the current board configuration. So let me search the best move given this particular <laughs> configuration. And that's just a search uh, kind of uh, method. And it, it's, we can consider this, this search compared with the training process, it, it's much less computationally intensive. So let's plot this four into the diagram. And the alpha go, I would say it's, uh, it's at the bottom, computationally high, I, I kind of question that, but that's, uh, uh, we can move it to the lab a little bit. 
And the vision is in between in the gain to pre-conscious pre -conscious state and the natural language processing for sure. When we talk about when we have language talk, to have conversation with each other, we have to gain to consciousness state. And uh, of course, if we just look at alphabets, right, we probably in unconscious state, but eventually when we formulate an article a conversation with others, we gain to the consciousness state. So these are just some examples. And now we come, come here to look at the Schrodinger's point of view, a look at consciousness in relation to learning and adaptation. So he's looking from the evolution perspective. And more specifically, he also using physics to try to explain uh, these two modes. So the first one is the second law of uh, thermodynamics. The second we already mentioned quantum mechanics and this quantum jump. And finally, he mentioned the relationship with mortality. But mortality, uh, we will talk about in the last lecture. So humans select to learn. So when we want to learn something, we learn for two purposes. We learn for wants or we learn for needs, right? So needs are basic survival requirement, like eating, cooking. Those are, you can consider to be needs. Or we want to find water, right? We want to learn how to dig a well. And those are for needs, not optional. And uh, for needs, we talk about in the bottom, survival or adaptation, and human must learn to survive. If uh, we have job condition here in, in uh, Santa Clara, uh, we probably would go, go to supermarket to buy drinking water, or we go to other states to find water. We have to be able to adapt to survive. But there are certain essential skills we don't have to learn at all. In fact, we cannot learn, and we are not affording learn to learn, or we don't know how to learn them, and we don't have time to learn them. Give, just give you two examples, breathing and the heartbeat, right? When and the embryo can already start having heartbeats. Do you think embryo learns how to do heartbeats? No, embryo doesn't have consciousness. So it's interesting, uh, the complex operations of human being were already given before we were born. We did not have to learn them, and actually we couldn't learn them. Can, can you learn how to breathe differently or uh, changing your heartbeat rhythms consciously? The answer is really no, not really, right? So philosophically, you would say, oh, most challenging matters already been given by someone or evolution. And, but only the not so important things, I say, wants, your desire. I want to have something better to eat, right? I, I want to swim. I, I want to bike. You, you don't, you, if you don't bike, you can, you can still survive. You can, you can walk to the classroom, maybe get more healthier. So for the optional things, yes, we can learn. But for the essential matters, we cannot learn. We don't have time to learn. And they are embedded in our, our body. I actually, uh, when I translated Schrodinger's What is Life, right, uh, my own feeling at the end was saying, well, what we could learn in the world is really, really limited. First of all, essential skills already been given, right? And secondly, when we were born, we are confined by our heritage, heritage including broadly, including not only our chromosome DNA, but also including our identity. And uh, our DNA gave us our IQ, maybe mortality means diseases and EQ, personality. And uh, we also, we were born with identity, nationality, family, or nationality and family already give us some intrinsic directions, inertias. Nationality already give you a set of hates, right? And uh, your 
family may, may already give, give you a set of possible religions you would, you would try to convert into. So you don't really have a lot of choices. Yes, some people are more rebel, rebellious. They, they can defy their identities, but most of people would just be, be conformant. And so therefore, what we could learn mostly is for our wants. And they are optional, they are extra curriculum. And I was joking about the, the free will we have. Uh, it's probably just uh, older dishes uh, on GoDash or in the restaurant. And other things pretty much restricted. Okay, free will, we, we go to, uh, when we go to lecture 18, free will is, is, uh, is kind of a philosophical question. Do we really have free will, right? Uh, it's, it's just a survey for the for fun of it. How many consider you have free will? How many consider you don't have free will whatsoever? No? Okay. So uh, Lex Freeman, an MIT professor, right? He has uh, uh, produced many podcasts. So far, I think he has, he's getting you about 270 uh, episodes. And in the early days, the podcast, each episode is about one hour. And the start is about 200. There's no limit of time. So there are podcasts lasting even four or five hours. And it's really, really intriguing sometimes, some subjects. And the two questions you always ask, uh, most of, most of uh, the guest speakers you will ask, the first question is, are you a robot, right? Then do you really, do you think human has free will? You have free will or not? Everything is predetermined or not? But surprisingly, those smart people he interviewed Nobel laureate uh, during award winners, and uh, their answers are pretty coherent, right? Uh, most of the people, like including myself, I, I consider I'm a, I'm a robot. Uh, free will is my illusion. Okay, okay. let's uh, come back to a, a late lecture. So human, how, how do we learn? We learn starting from, we have a need to learn, then starts from uh, external stimulus. We suppose here we're just using a vision as an example. Our retinas start to sensing pixels. And then we, our perception, our sensing will convert into quantifiable, so we call sensual qualities. So in, a, in, in vision, right, the sensing, we're sensing a lot of pixels into our eyes. Those are electrical signals, then the essential quality is kind of color. It's a, it's a vital one. Then you could say texture, shape, and eventually we have understanding, we recognize objects. And object recognition requires our memory at the same time. So let's just look at the first stage of sensing. Uh, we have sensing the signals and then essential quality. So do we get identical central quality? So here, again, we may only in unconscious state, right? So the picture on the top, uh, this lower picture, it's only sensing and producing sensory quality. And then gain to our either uh, cerebrum or cerebellum, either processing consciousness or consciously. And finally, we have responses. And this is the process of learning. And in just the sensing mode, do we have, is, is, is this a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship? Uh, do we have uh, one signal producing one sen sensual quality, or there could be a mixture of multiple signals can produce one sensual quality, and the one signal can produce multiple different sensual quality. So the very, very simple question is, when we perceive a sensual quality to be to be yellow, yellow color. So what should be the input to our retina? Right? So if we look at the light spectrum, when we have this uh, 60 uh, nanometer signal and uh, it picks in our eye as yellow color. This is given by Schrodinger and now it's, it's well known. Same central quality can come from different mixture of signals. So if we have two other signals, 
535, which is green, and plus six, 760, which is red. The combine of the two also give us yellow sensation. So here we have possibility of multiple signals combination, different mixtures can give us the same sensation or same sensual quality. So then we have to think about computer, how computer operates. Can computer function under this situation? Different inputs have the different output. I think computer could do that, right? Function can handle many to one mapping. But the problem is the other way. The other way is same color, different sensual qualities in different individuals. So it's very evident for people having a colorblind, their sensual quality is different. Even we are perceiving the same thing. And they have red, green, colorblind, blue, yellow, and also complete uh, colorblind. And let's look at one example of red, green, uh, color, colorblind. On the left-hand side, there's, there's no colorblind. On the right-hand side, this person have a red, green colorblind, how the person perceived. So here is already interesting. This is a, a good picture produced by psychiatrists. But how can psychiatrists figure out, like how can I figure out your color quality? When we looked at this picture on the left hand side, and I myself see yellow, green, and the red, and maybe other colors, but you may also see the same colors, or you may not, right? Uh, for colorblind, they only see green, but suppose we don't have colorblind, even the same red for us, the sensation in our redness may be different. Your red is probably different from my red. So this is already to us, it's very challenging to computer. It's also very challenging because you have different inputs. We all consider to be the same. And uh, this year is you, you have even different uh, color qualities. Still, people can recognize you have maybe a uh, different fruit here, apples and the pineapple and so on and so forth. Now let's review two math concepts. The first one is relation. relation defines as a relationship between two values. And we have four different relations on this slide. One to many, one to one, many to one, and then many to many. And however, function is a relation where each input has only one output. So among the four relations, only the two in the middle, one to one, and the many to one, produces one output. They are legitimate functions. So now let's go back to uh, visit our visual system. We have input as senses, and input generates sensual qualities. As we already mentioned, using colorblind as an example, and here we have one-to-many uh, relationship. And then from the sensual quality, let's say you and I both look at the ocean, and we may have different emotion incurred because maybe our uh, memory or our contextual information. So therefore, we encounter this interesting problem of from senses to sensual quality is not a function. And uh, from sensual quality to emotion is not a function either. But in our CNN or machine learning algorithms, we typically implement everything as a function. So therefore, the interesting challenge to us is how can we model one to many? When we consider contextual information and memory, and this we call subjectivity. Now let's pop up one level. Let's revisit our stimulus response pathway. We already talked about input generating sensing quality. And before human can produce a response, our brain will be operating on the signals and making a decision. And our brain operates in two different modes, consciousness and unconsciousness. When we define consciousness in the beginning of lecture, we try to contrast the term consciousness with attention. 
Attention can be either bottom up as shown on the left hand side of this diagram or top down. When attention is top down, it's pretty much goal driven and it operates in the consciousness mode. Well, however, when attention is bottom up, it's a stimulus driven. So we continue sensing our word and uh, when the collected energy reaches a certain threshold, then there is a transition going on from unconsciousness to consciousness. And I really appreciate the explanation done by uh, Erwin Schrodinger, the father of quantum mechanics. Uh, let's take a look at how CNN neuron works. A neuron collects information from upstream neurons, and when the energy, energy level reaches a threshold, the neuron will fire and will propagate the signal to the downstream neurons. And this is precisely how Schrodinger explains the state transition between an atom. An atom can be in two different modes on this uh, slide, mode 1 and mode 2. An atom in a stable state until the energy level reaches 3. And once the energy level reaches a threshold, then there's a probability a state transition will happen. And this is exactly the genius of CNN model, which is models exactly how Schrodinger depicts the state transition uh, physically in the atoms. So how about the other way? How do we transition from the consciousness state to unconscious state? When we listen to music, and uh, in the beginning we may be paying attention to the lyric, but eventually, or in my case, I will fall into sleep. And driving is another experience. If I'm very familiar with the route, I do, do not really pay attention to the details. An emotion or emotion of sadness or happiness eventually will fade away. And these are all good things because in the emotion scenario, we don't want to be sad forever. And evolution builds in in our brain, we will forget about the sadness and at the same time we, we cannot be happy forever. We have to transition into the normal mode and to continue to live with our lives. And Schrodinger saying, well, the transition, this uh, kind of fading away, can be thought as second law of thermodynamics. The second law of th thermodynamics expresses the fundamental and the simple truth about the universe that disorder characterized by a quantity called entropy always increases. When the entropy is picked, the isol isolated system is we call in a dead state or inert state. And like our physical body eventually uh, aging is a phenomena of the second law of thermodynamics. And Schrodinger in his book was actually a joke about how can we live longer by slowing down our increase of disorder. And there he suggested a couple of remedies. If you are interested, we can talk about it offline. The second law may be formulated by the observation that entropy is in an isolated system uh, left to spontaneous evolution cannot decrease. As this system always arrives at a state of thermodynamic equilibrium and where the entropy is the highest. And there are several experiments and which can illustrate how this uh, second law works. A popular one is in a closed space, uh, you inject some color particles and eventually the color particles will be distributed evenly in a closed space. Or maybe you input two different kinds of air, one in green color, the other one in red color. And uh, after a period of time, 
uh, those two colors were mixed together. Now we uh, put everything together and we start with uh, in this uh, consciousness state we learn how to walk, how to bike and the first time come to Stanford we have to navigate using a map and so on and so forth. So once we get familiar with walking, biking and uh, also the driving directions and we get into a habitual and repeti repetitive mode and then there's a transition happens and when we continue doing these tasks we will be operating this most of these tasks in unconsciousness mode as we mentioned this is really good for the human being and for animals because uh, our emotion we like them to fade away so we can get on to our lives so in the unconscious mode see here we do a lot of tasks including our heartbeats metabolism unconsciously but if we drive to the campus and suddenly we see an unexpected pedestrian we are suddenly transitioning back to the conscious mode to try to figure out how to uh, handle that situation and uh, if you bike you hit a tree suddenly yes we need to start there and uh, transition to a conscious mode and handle the abrupted situation this is called adaptation is necessary for survival okay let's now make some observations and in consciousness and unconsciousness and when they need to transition they transition via two uh, physics mechanisms quantum jump and the second law of quantum mechanics and uh, these are great because we have a solid foundation to implement the transitions and we're learning for adaptation is done in a consciousness mode and uh, mainly for our biological needs and for our our wants which could be optional and we eventually fade emotion into unconscious state when things are repetitive and we also talk about in the conscious state and when we pay attention uh, it could be top-down attention because we are aware of the bigger picture then we want to focus on some specifics and uh, in attention or in a conscious mode uh, one in in important element is uh, we cannot model this as just a function because there could be one to many mapping it means uh, one uh, sensing quality can map to different emotions and this we call subjectivity a machine does not have subjectivity if you look at today's machine learning today's machine learning is the result is the average of subjectivity the training data may be labeled by different people they have their own subjectivities and we aggregate everything together and uh, uniformly or universally we learn a set of parameters and uh, then perform prediction and how can we model subjectivity this we can talk about shortly after uh, these observations uh, we one way to do it to avoid this uh, function definition issue is we can take more arguments like if we take space time and the value into the arguments of a function then there's a possibility we have this quantum one-to-one one -to -one mapping and bottom-up attention is performed in the unconscious mode so we can only pay attention to one or two things and at the same time there are many things going on in the environment and uh, our sense organs continuously sensing the environment our heart continues to beat until something unusual happens which will trigger a high energy then a transition will be made into a conscious mode Yes, uh, but when quantum jump performs prematurely, it means the threshold is abnormally low, like Dr. Duvari uh, introduced mental disorder on Monday's lecture uh, for phobia, let's say echophobia. The fear of heights got triggered at a much lower threshold. 
and this must be treated. At this moment, the treatment can only be treated uh, targeting symptoms. But in the future, hopefully, we can get down to the source. And this is precisely what the next lecture will cover. Where is consciousness? Let's defer the discussion uh, to next Monday. In closing the first half of the lecture, we were born with a lot of sophisticated skills, right? Metabolism, heartbeat, and so on and so forth. So they all operate in the unconsciousness mode. And then, because we need to adapt, we need to survive, and we learn knowledge, we learn skills. And once we are familiar with the skills, they become our second nature. We can perform the skills habitually. However, our learned knowledge and skills is never written back to the DNA. And that's very ironic. So our next generation, they have to learn reading, they have to render biking over the again. And evolution will not be helpful for our future generations to be able to born with the biking and the driving skills. And this we can also address why in the next lecture through a thorough investigation on the evolution theory. Now we get to uh, how to model subjective uh, consciousness. And we know in machine learning, one of the most important construct is distance function. We measure similarity. Machine learning tests, for example, clustering or classification, we need to measure similarity between instances. We also need to be able to quantify differential. Now here, this example shows classification in machine learning. And I argue all the classification problems in machine learning considers a nearest neighbor problem. So in this example, we have two known classes. One rectangle uh, blue, the other one is a triangle red. And now we have an unknown instance. We don't know its label sitting in the middle of the circle, which is round green. So how should we determine the color and the shape of the unknown instance? Suppose we draw nearest neighbors using circle. And we have two circles here, one in solid line, one in dashes. The solid line circle is smaller. So in a small neighborhood, and we basically, we look into the labels of those instances. Here we have three two triangles and one rectangle, and we perform a majority vote. And they say, oh, the instance in the middle, we are going to use a uh, red color and triangle to label it. And when we expand the nearest neighbor to be larger, and now we have five instances, the majority vote for us, in this case, we get a uh, blue rectangle. So I argue all machine learning algorithms regardless whether it's a CNN top level or supervised machines and so on and so forth, all have the concepts of nearest neighbor and you measure similarity at the end, it's sort of like a voting scheme and the label, the unknown instance is labeled. So we have two important uh, measures we need to be able to quantify. The first one is what is the distance, how to measure distance between two instances. The second measure is what is the definition of nearest neighbor. Let's investigate further. Now let's examine how do we find uh, nearest neighbor instances. So given a point here, we have this round uh, blue dot in the middle. Suppose we kind of simplify the problem setting. Uh, each instance has only two attributes, and one in the S dimension, the other one in the Y dimension. And the value of each dimension ranges from zero to one. So if I want to find my nearest neighbor, I need to give it a range. 
if I say range is everything, then you have to sequentially uh, scan all your data items. This is definitely not very efficient. So in data structures, we have different tree structures. The pr purpose of the tree structures is for efficient lookup. And uh, for range query in this case, we like to be able to scan minimum amount of data to find all the nearest neighbors. In this example here, suppose we say, oh, my nearest neighbor, I can define to be a half of the value. So F value is a fraction, let's say 50%. And dimension here is equal to two. So nearest neighbor is 25% of the area of the entire feature space. And when D value, D is the dimensionality of the data and it's getting larger and larger. Suppose we say fraction is equal to uh, 0.9 and 0.9 when the dimension grows to about 100, then the volume basically is uh, the fraction power of D approximates to zero. This means the instance in the middle cannot find any nearest neighbors. All the so-called nearest neighbors are very far away because the fraction of your search range query, range query is already 90%. So how do we mitigate this problem? And how to address the problem? There has been many methods. I'm not going to get into details. In the first lecture, we talk about the dimension reduction, uh, right? We talk about all these different methods. And then we say, well, maybe transfer learning, maybe pre-training, maybe other, other means. And we try to, the, the good thing is all the data, they don't just randomly spread out in the feature space. And the objects tend to have similar objects, similar attributes. So therefore we are looking at the problem of clusters of objects. And uh, similar objects are highly clusters in the feature space. So that saves the day. Uh, of this classification. If we can find just a few clusters, then do attention, right? Then we talk about top-down attention. So at the top, we say there are this uniform situation, we are dead, but there are 20 or 30 clusters out there. And let's look at two or three most likely clusters. And we then we zoom in our attention to e look into each clusters. Then we may suffer from a lower recall because we may be seeing some good clusters, but the, the searching speed, a speed will be higher. Once we get into a cluster, the precision, of course, is not an issue. Now, distance function. And this is a, a, a very essential topic for AI. And uh, at the end, I'd like you to think about, do we have the right distance function today? Right? Do you remember when we talk about NLP, the history of NLP? We say, well, we need to quantify the distance, similarity between words, right? And we say, well, we have problem of synonyms and uh, polysemy. A synonyms may be easier, you can do clustering, but polysemy can be more challenging. And uh, also clustering can handle the problem, but poly polysemy, we need to deal with it very carefully is when we have contextual information. So let's look at distance functions in the past, how we choose our distance function. In Minkowski function, basically, if we have two objects, S and Y, and each object has K attributes, K can be ranging from one to maybe 1,000. And then we just say, oh, each object, we go through their attributes and compare all the attribute differences then sum them up. And there are different ways to quantify this sum. The first way is saying, oh, I want to square the sum because I don't want to worry about negative, positive. I just want to do a square of distance. Then I sum them together. And the second method is, again, I don't care about positive, negative. I just will care about distance. I do this absolute value. The third one is saying, well, you have square. Why not have different kind of exponential number? Just have Q in general then you just normalize use one over Q. So we call the first one Euclidean distance, second one Manhattan distance, 
and last one mean cos mean cos function in general. And the, for the Manhattan distance, they call that because it's like a, a street street ball distance. Right? You you look at every dimension, you don't do a square, but in the Euclidean you do a a straight line, a straight straight different di distance between two points. So so which method is better for vision? Right. According to all the empirical study in the past, Manhattan functions seem to work more work better. Although intuitively you want to say maybe Euclidean makes more sense, right? I, I just want to know the distance between two points. But the trouble of Euclidean is the square over there. When you have a square, it means when you have a minority number of attributes, they have large differences then they will impact your distance function uh, non-proportionally. So you, I suppose you have one, two outliers and they have difference of 20. The rest of the attributes difference is only, let's say, 0.2. Then this 20 or 10, when they you have an exponential over there, two, power of two, then those two attributes will dominate your similarity uh, measurement. So therefore, Manhattan is is better, you don't have the problem. And, and some folks even use the Q equal to a half, right? Say, well, one is good, one is better than two, why not just a half? We want to normalize uh, the distance, make sure all the attributes maybe have equal in importance. But that's really empirical study to figure out. Well, the second family of function is called cosine function. Right? You must heard about this really, really often. Uh, in high dimensional space, people tend to use this one because computationally you, you just do a dot product and you can get a distance function. And, uh, but let's think about attention and consciousness now. So what we have depicted so far, let's just think about you create distance function. The distance function, do you think it works in, in unconscious mode or consciousness mode. Because once the distance function is already there, if I ask you a question of, do you think New York and, and, uh, and uh, LA, are they similar or not? You cannot process using your consciousness. You have to obey the distance function. And distance function will say, oh, there are many attributes when you want to compare those two cities, and you compare every single attribute you summon together, that's your answer. There's no subjectivity, right? But that's not a way human compare similarity between objects. So these are the progress in psychology or psychiatry in the last 100 years. First of all, in 1928, and the psych, 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 psychiatrists believe Objects are similar in all respects. So this is Minkowski function. You consider all attributes. The only difference is the weight, square or cube, right? And uh, Minkowski function. Then after 50 years, and we have a new theory by uh, Versky, objects are similar in some respects. Not all respects, certain respects you can ignore. Okay, so it came up with weighted Minkowski function. So you have a, put a weight in front of each attribute. Certain weights can be lower, certain weights can be higher. If you don't care about, uh, let's say, once you have uh, wear a mask, the face recognition system should just dismiss whatever in, in, the, in the second region. I don't know why Apple takes, takes so long to come up with a new uh, face recognition system, right? Now you can unlock your phone even your, with your mask on. But to me, it still failed. I don't know what the algorithm was working on. But you can say it definitely downplay whatever beneath uh, your eyes. But similarity in 94, uh, Goldstone saying similarity is a process of determining respects rather than use predefined respects. And this really flips the consciousness and unconsciousness. So one and two, the paradigm, it's really unconscious. You got given a function, you don't even need to think, that's it. But goes on saying, no, no, no. You are in a conscious state. You are determining the respects 
not respect or determine for you. So therefore, this example I put in one of our publications was, was quite interesting. So the question is, pick two cities similar to San Francisco, right? So I assume, you know, let's don't do this experiment here because of time limitation, but my assumptions, out of you, you may pick two different sets, right? Why? Because in my case, when I do comparison, I don't have a function to start with. Although there are possible attributes down there, location, climate, demographics, culture, and so on and so forth, but only when I realize the objects I want to compare, let's say I start to compare San Francisco and New York, and the, the respects surfaces on my on my consciousness. I say, oh, uh, San Francisco, New York, they are similar in maybe traffic, definitely not similar in location, right? They are one East Coast, one West Coast. And uh, of course, if a context is different, oh, they are both in the US, that's a different story. The cultural uh, mixtures, they are similar. They have uh, multiple cultures and, and, and the attributes come out when you have the objects surface. And they say Los Angeles, or Tokyo. They say Los Angeles is similar to, to San Francisco. Los Angeles and, uh, and, and San Francisco, location-wise, they are close. But when you say San Francisco and Tokyo, they say, no, 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 they are very far apart. But some people still consider San Francisco is uh, similar to Tokyo because uh, it, it's a metropolitan city, and uh, San Francisco has a Japan town, and Tokyo definitely has a lot of uh, uh, Japanese uh, goods and, and cultural. And so, this comparison is really subjective and which respects you want to focus on it's a consciousness uh, operation rather than unconscious unconsciousness so this really makes a huge difference when we're looking forward and when we want to quantify similarity for the machine learning task so similarity is quantified only a pair of objects being compared are realized. This is a key sentence. So you, you cannot predefine the distance function. So here, how do we implement it? We implemented uh, 20 years ago with my student. And uh, on the right hand side, you can see there are M objects. And if, if you want to compare them, whether they are similar or not, based on their values here, uh, you probably say, well, every pair the common objects, the common bit got flipped to one. Every pair is only two, only minority. So you say, no, they are not very similar. But on the left-hand side of the example, you say, oh, ABC could be similar because when you do voting, majority voting, uh, between two, between each pair, they have three attributes similar. They have majority attributes similar, right? They, they, they are not identical, but they have three attributes similar. So at the end, our finding is the following. If you look at this next picture, and this is way before this uh, data augmentation was performed. So in year 2001, and my student Bei Tao, he said, well, Giving me, given me this the five thousand images. I'm doing convert, do convert conversion of the, those images, including converting JPEG to GIF, and we crop images, we rotate images, and then we scale certain images. When we crop the images, we make sure that the gist of image remain to be in the Im image. Let's say the barbecue, you keep the barbecue uh, relevant objects or or features still in the crop image. So then we say we quantify every uh, image. We do feature extraction with three type of features, color, texture, and the shape, right? So if you look at the picture here, we have 144 attributes for every image. And then we say, okay, we compare the original image with converted images, transform images. The first one, A, com compare with GIF images. Basically, we were just changing the format and the bottom one is a rotated image and the, on the bottom right, uh, scaled images. And then you look at the channels here. We have 144 attributes. And uh, if we consider 0 0.2, 0 0.02, 0 
to be the similarity threshold we are, we are willing to accept, then even in the chief conversion, we can, we can harvest maybe a half of them, about 70 or 80 uh, converted images to say, well, they have sufficient number of attributes similar to the original image. And if you look at rotate image, rotate image is very simple because in the rotate image, certain features wouldn't change. Uh, it happens the first 108 features are color features. If we rotate an image, use a, any color histogram, the feature will not change. So here you can say the differences between colors are, are very small. And the scale images color pretty much remain the same, color distribution is the same, but texture and shape may be different. And uh, similarly, crop images, you have more varieties, right? Uh, so let's say if we want to increase the threshold to point, point 0.1, and even in the crop images, you can find sufficient number of similar objects uh, because of they have sufficient number of similar attributes. So the idea to form a distance function here then is we actually just want to have majority. We don't care about which attributes. So for GIF images, you see similar attributes, some in color, some in shape, and some maybe in texture. And uh, for crop images, the channels with small differences are always also distributed in different features. Although in rotating images, uh, similar features tend to be in a color channel. But once you say, oh, let me give you a threshold they say if you have uh, 108 attributes similar out of 144, I declare those two images are similar. Otherwise, I say those two images are not similar. But just using this heuristic, we can detect all these kind of transform images, all the original image, very, very accurately. And uh, when we compete with other state of our results uh, 10, 20 years ago, we outperform all other methods by just doing this very simple change. The only question is, how do you determine the threshold, right? The threshold should be 0 0.2 or, or 0 0.4 or 0 0.1. And uh, with some top-down hints, right, then this can be resolved. So you, you just say, oh, uh, I already tell you the crop images are cropped non-substantially. They should be similar to the original image. Or you say scale image should be the same as the original image. You tell me that, then I can do reverse engineering to find out, OK, given uh, this particular set of attributes and given 144 features, how should I set the threshold value? So I will accept enough number of channels to be similar and declare those objects to be similar. And uh, to write down the formula uh, the formula was not too challenging basically we only have this m and r two attributes and we have this delta m means the smallest of m sigmas you find the small smallest m sigmas m differences and m is the threshold i just mentioned about so m out of 144 should m be 85 or 108 that should be done through data mining but once you have m then distance can be quantified using this uh, we call dynamic partial function dynamic means every pair of objects the distance function to compare similarity will be different and uh, partial means you don't need to weight all objects in the distance function you only pick the smallest uh, deltas or smallest uh, attributes differences to be into your distance function so although this method works so well, but it's computational intensive, you need to have all objects compare in a pairwise manner. And therefore I leave you the last slide. And this could be some really interesting long-term research. You look at our attention model today, it's not good enough if you consider a top-down attention. The attention model today is only doing bottom-up attention because we started from the lower layer neurons, then we aggregate information. Eventually we have a list of, we call feature, high-level feature learned at the top. Then we do attention 
And uh, finally, we get uh, our target task formulated. So here at the top level, our distance function is pretty much weighted Minkowski function. And should that distance function be modified? So therefore we can do kind of pairwise realizations, support subjective similarity measure and support dynamic uh, to the contextual information. I think the answer should be yes. And this is an opportunity I consider uh, quantifiable to put system two above system one. So this pretty much concludes uh, the, the lecture today. What is consciousness? And uh, the next lecture we talk about where is consciousness? And uh, you may still feel what is consciousness say after today's lecture, even with uh, Kaku's uh, uh, intuitions with Schrodinger's uh, quantum mechanics and the uh, second law of thermodynamics, you still don't feel easy about it. But when we learn more about where is consciousness, I think we can feel slightly more comfortable. So that will be next Monday. And next Wednesday, Dr. Duari will come back to wrap up his uh, psychology or psych psychiatry perspective on abnormality and uh, normalcy of, of the mental, mental state. Any questions you can send me after the lecture? And uh, hopefully you have uh, made good progress on your project. So I see you next week. Thank you.